Well, I'm here this morning. I get the privilege to preach to you today. Pastor Randy and Pastor Darla are over at Miracle Farm today. Uh, Randy's getting the best of both worlds. He gets to preach and rope today all in the same day. So, so we're over there being a blessing to them and, and believing that God's going to do some awesome ministry today over at Miracle Farm through Pastor Randy and Pastor Darla. Uh, and I get the privilege to share with you today. So if you want to turn to your Bibles, we're going to be in Judges chapter 6. Uh, if you have one of those amazing digital Bibles where you can pick whatever version you're uh, reading from. I'm going to be out of the New Living Translation, so you can follow along in that. Uh, we're going to look at this idea of how we break the chains of fear, and we're going to look at the life of Gideon and how, how God does that, uh, how he wants to break those chains. When I was a kid, I, I had this fear inside of me. Maybe if some of you are, are brave enough to admit it, you were a lot like me, but how many of you were afraid of the dark when you were a kid? Okay, I'm not all by myself. See, it's okay to raise your hand, all right? Nobody's judging here. That was me, man. I was afraid uh, of the dark. Maybe it's because I watched that Gremlin movie with those weird creatures when I was a kid. I, I don't know for sure, but I was just convinced something either lived in the closet or lived under my bed. And so for me, the, the safest thing I could do at night, I would wrap myself up and I would leave just a big enough hole that I could breathe without, you know, I didn't want to die in the middle of the night, but somehow I felt safe if I could get every piece of me wrapped up under the covers. Anybody else there? Like, that's just like a sweet spot to be, thank you. Okay, there's a few of you. I suddenly don't feel quite so bad, but I don't know why I lived with that fear growing up, but for me, there was this security, and I don't know why a blanket made me feel safe. It wasn't like it was going to stop a bullet or a knife or somebody from ripping it off of me, but somehow in my mind, it was a safe place for me, that, that being wrapped up, there was some security there, even though it was a false sense of security, there was nothing secure there. And we've all kind of had those fears that we've wrestled with in, in some way, some shape, or form growing up. Some of you were bold enough to admit your fear of the dark. Some of you had a fear of animals. You heard me maybe poke fun just a little bit at my wife and her fear of dogs, but uh, some of you guys are afraid of sharks. Thanks to Jaws, you'll never go swimming even in Lake Conroe because you're convinced a shark is going to jump out and get a hold of you. Uh, afraid of mice or spiders. Uh, Pastor Darla says that there are good snakes, but the only good one I know of is a dead one. And so um, that we all live in some of those fears. We, we have fears of the, the unknown or the things that we we can't control, fear of the dark, because we can't see what's going on in the dark, because we don't know what's there, that, that little leprechaun that lives in our closet, or that weird looking clown from Stephen King's It that lives under our bed, and, and so we live in a, a measure of fear to that. Um, we live in measure of fear to tornadoes or other uh, earthquakes, things that are beyond our ability to control. People live in fear of the what ifs, right? We play the what if game. What if I'm driving across that bridge that goes over that span of water and that thing collapses and I fall in the water? Am I going to drown? Anybody have the what if game where you play with those fears? Okay, there's a few brave souls. Thank you guys. It's free to be afraid and be brave today, all right? So we play that what if game. What if this happened? What if that happened? And we allow our mind to begin to run in those fears. There's those ego fears that we, we somehow have. The fear that I'm not going to be good enough the fear that I'll never measure up, the fear of, of failure, the fear of, of what are people going to think about me. And somehow we think that, that in the middle of those fears, as we're afraid, if we'll just take our blanket, somehow wrap it around us in the middle of those fears, everything's going to be okay, even though we know it's really not. And we lull ourselves into this false sense of security. We lull ourselves into this false sense of, of peace that, that doesn't exist there. And today I want to look at the life of Gideon. Pastor Randy spent the last couple weeks talking about people who have taken bold steps, bold obedience in following God. We talked about Daniel and the three Hebrew boys when they went into Babylon and the faith that they had. We talked about, uh, for those of you that have kids, Rack, Shack, and Benny, if you watch Veggie Tales, um, otherwise known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, and the, the bold faith that they had. Daniel in the lion's den last week and the incredible faith and obedience that he placed in God. And here is the reality that I know. God's not done writing bold stories of faith. He still wants to write those stories with your life, not just my life as a pastor, but with yours. 
But that same God who wants to write bold stories of faith and bold acts of obedience and following him, there is an enemy out there who wants to destroy what God's trying to do. And over and over and over again, he uses a tactic called fear to try to keep God's people from being who he's called them to be. As you study out the Bible, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes that there's nothing new under the sun, and he's absolutely right. The enemy's tactics haven't changed. He still uses the same tactics that he's always used. He just dresses them up a little different. And today, I want you to know that God wants you to find freedom from the fear that tries to control your life. He wants to set you free from the false sense of security that you try to walk around in, pretending like everything's okay, hiding underneath a blanket. Knowing full well underneath that blanket, you're still vulnerable, you're still hurting, you're still trapped, and you don't see a way out. And I want to look at the life of Gideon and how God used him and set him free from the fear that he was in. And I want to give you just maybe a bit of backstory here, but before I do, here's what I hope you walk away from today. If you walk away with nothing else, I hope you walk away from the, with this. Bold living for God means shedding the chains of fear. See, you can be controlled by God or you can be controlled by fear, but you cannot be controlled by both because they're opposite of each other. And so we, if we want to walk in that freedom from fear, we have to learn to walk in who God's called us to be. And we have to break those chains of fear. And Gideon is the perfect story. Maybe I like Gideon because I can relate to him so much. But Israel at this time is in this cycle. Uh, they get lost in sin and turn from God. Uh, things get bad enough that they hit rock bottom and they ask God for help. He sets them free and then they hit repeat and the cycle goes all over again. They turn away from God. They give in to sin. They hit rock bottom. God sets them free. Repeat. Kind of sounds like us sometimes, right? If we'll be honest. And the amazing thing as you study this out is the people that had Israel in bondage in this moment was an enemy that God had already defeated for them. They were being beaten by somebody they had already beaten. How many times does that feel like us in our battle against fear? We have moments where we feel like, yes, I've had the breakthrough. I'm free from this thing only to a little ways down the road if we're not careful and continue on in that fight, we find ourselves being beaten by the same fear that we thought we had beaten once before. And that's the life of Gideon. This is the moment that we find them in when God steps in and begins to have this conversation with Gideon in Judges chapter 6, verse 6. It says this, So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites, and then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Why do we have to hit rock bottom before we turn to God and ask him for help? That's why we're having this message today, because my hope is there's somebody out here today that you have not hit rock bottom yet, that there's somebody watching online that you've not come to the bottom of everything yet, and this message is for you to keep you from having to hit rock bottom before you turn from God. But if you are at rock bottom, then this message is for you to tell you that's not the end of your story, that God has another one for you besides that. As we read on in Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 7, he says this, that when they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites, and he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Now notice, they asked for God's help. Here's his response. I brought you out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. What God's saying here is you're walking in sin. You need to turn. You need to stop. You need to repent. You need to address the issue of sin in your life. And the first point that I want to make today is if you want to shed the chains of fear, you have to shed the chains of sin. And it's like, oof, did he just say that three-letter word? I did, right? This is one of those that's like not very comfortable to talk about in today's world, in today's society. Don't talk too much about sin because it offends me because, because what's wrong for you may not be wrong for me, but the reality is what's right is right in God's word and what's wrong is wrong in God's word. And it's the same for all of us. And so we're going to look at it from that perspective. And I want to, to, to give you not just that perspective, but God's perspective on what sin is and how he addresses it, because I think we get the wrong perspective here. And I want to start it off by saying this, the most loving thing someone can do is point out the sin in your life you may be missing. 
But sometimes somebody, the most loving thing they can offer you is to say, hey, I see this in your life. I don't know if you do, but I want to warn you, you're heading down a path that you don't want to go down. That's the most loving thing somebody could do to you. We don't like that. We're uncomfortable with that. We live in a society that doesn't like to be told what sin is. And so as a church, we almost become scared. We've wrapped ourselves in that blanket of comfort and we want to keep people comfortable. And so we don't want to speak against this. But God loves you too much to let you keep walking in sin. I love you too much to let you keep walking in it. And so we're going to have that conversation today. Because God wants you to be free, but you can't walk in the freedom that he has if you can't get out of the sin that you're in. And that sin leaves you in a cycle of fear that you can't get out of. And God wants you to be free today. Listen, with my kids, I learned this growing up. When I would walk into the house, I would get two reactions from my kids usually. Most of the time, they would either run up and give me a hug or one of them would run and go hide. And they were hiding for two reasons. One, they like to play hide and go seek. But usually, they were hiding because they were just doing something that they weren't supposed to be doing and they got caught, so they ran and hid, right? What were they afraid of? Getting in trouble for what they had done. And somehow hiding behind that cabinet door, dad magically wasn't going to find you there and you weren't going to get in trouble for it. And we do the same thing with God. We take that blanket, we wrap it around ourselves, Somehow, maybe God's not going to see this. But I love God's response in this moment, and I want us to keep going here because the most loving thing we can do, again, is to have that pointed out, to have somebody step in and say that. And what I love is what goes on in Judges 6, starting in verse 11. Look at God's response to Israel's sin. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, not Oprah, which belonged to Joash, the clan of Abiezer, Gideon, the son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Notice what fear does. I don't have time to get into this one, but fear causes you to live a purpose God never intended you to live. That was a wine press. It wasn't made for threshing wheat. It was made for pressing wine. When you give into fear and you give into sin, the enemy wins because he gets you off of God's purpose and onto a purpose he never designed you to be walking in. But that's another sermon for another time. You can have that nugget. Just take it for later. In verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And in Gideon's mind in this moment, I have a feeling he said, what you talking about, Willis? Like, like me? I'm hiding in a wine press and you just called me a mighty hero. One version calls him a mighty man of valor. This guy's hiding. And God, what does he do? He steps right into the mess with Israel. Now, if I'm God, I'm coming in with lightning bolts and I'm killing some people for being dumb. It's a good thing I'm not God. Because God steps down. He's not looking to kill anybody. He's not looking to annihilate a bunch of people. He steps in and wants to help Israel out of the situation that they're in. And that's what God did to your sin and my sin. He sent his son down to earth to step into our mess to rescue you from the mess that you were in because you couldn't save yourself and that's how much he loves you. So don't let your sin keep you in fear. Take that false sense of comfort off and take that sin to God because he's already stepped into the mess and provided a way out for you. The only way you stay in those chains of fear is if you stay wrapped up in that sin. Pretending to call it something it's not when we just need to call it what it is, sin. And when we call it sin, it gets dealt with. And the Bible teaches us this, that if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And so we got to confess them so that we can be set free from them. And you can't do that hiding under a blanket of false comfort. You got to come out of there and have some confession time with God and confess those things to him. Here's what I know. God loves us so much. He wants in our mess, but he also loves us way too much to leave us there. But we got to start somewhere, and that's stepping out and letting God begin to do work in us that only he can do instead of keeping us under this false cover. The second point I want to point out here, we're going to look at a few of these instances in Gideon. But to shed the chains of fear, you have to shed the chains of lies. Too often we allow sin to, to get in the way of what God wants to do, and too often we allow the lies of the enemy to keep us from becoming who God has called us to be. 
Judges chapter 6, I read it already, but that's where Israel was in that cycle of sin. I'm going to do what God's called me to do, only to turn around and turn from God after I've done what he's asked me to do, and he doesn't benefit me anymore. And I want to ask you this question. Who is at the center of your relationship with God? Are you at the center, or is God at the center? There's a big difference. When God's on the throne, God's at the center. But when you're on the throne, you're at the center. That's a lie of the enemy because that, that relationship isn't about you, it's about God. And at some point, we have to be willing to address that lie, take ourselves off the throne and put God on it. That means you got to get out of the way and let God get in the way. That means you got to understand this life isn't all about you and what makes you happy and what makes you comfortable, but it's about the plans that God has for you. And it's about the bold steps of faith that he wants you to take. And when he's at the center, we'll go. But when we're at the center, we kind of put the pause button on God, right? I don't know, God, that's going to cost me a lot. I don't know, God, that's going to hurt. That's a lot of sacrifice that you're asking from me, God. But when God's at the center, we go, we do, we follow. We plant a church in our backyard in a Pentecostal tent and do crazy things like that because God's called us to when he's at the center. But we got to fight against that lie. We have to press up against that in order to become who God's called us to be. The second lie that we have to fight against is to shed the lie of who you think you are. See, what I love about Gideon is God calls Gideon a mighty man of valor while he's hiding in fear. In fact, Gideon follows that up in verse 13, and he looks at God, and he's like, who are you talking about? Like, I'm the least of these. I'm a nobody. You got the wrong guy here. That's the, the Jason Mock version of the story, okay? That's the brief version. You go back and read it. But that's essentially what Gideon tells God, because that's a lie of the enemy stuck in Gideon's head. And for some of you, you're stuck in that same lie. And let me tell you what that lie is. When that lie gives birth to what it is, it's sin. When you believe the lie that you're not good enough and that I'll never measure up and I can never be who you've called me to be, that's a lie. And that's sin. Because at the end of the day, you're either serving somebody's opinion of you or you're serving your own opinion of you. You're not serving God's opinion of you. That's hard. That hurts a little bit, doesn't it? That's truth that will set you free from the fear that God's trying to keep you in. When you say, I'm not good enough, you're looking at God and telling him, you didn't make me good enough. I'm not going to shake that finger in God's face. But that's what you're doing. When you say, I'll never be good enough, you're telling God, you're not strong enough to work through me and use me. I'm not wagging that finger in God's face either. But God tells us something different. He speaks to Gideon and calls him a mighty man of valor before he ever was because God doesn't speak to who we are. He speaks to who we can be in and through him. And we got to get a hold of that truth and let that set us free from the lie of the enemy. That when God looks at you, he says, you're valuable and you're precious and you're my handiwork and you are good. You are brand new. You are not defined by your past, but you're defined by your future in Christ. And that's something to get excited about today. Yeah. And that's who God speaks to. That's the lie he's trying to set you free from today. The lie the enemy wants to keep you in because he knows who you can become in Christ if he can keep you wrapped up in that lie and keep you trapped in that sin. You gotta shed the lies that it's all God's fault. In verse 13, as you go on to read, Gideon basically accuses the Lord. The Lord has abandoned us. This is another one of those good moments where I'm not God because about the time Gideon wagged that finger in my face, I'd be ready to throw some more bolts. Listen, God didn't abandon Israel. Israel abandoned God. In fact, God's standing right there in front of Gideon in that moment having this conversation with him. Like, who are you accusing of abandoning you? I'm right here, right now. Listen, it's so much easier to blame somebody else for your problems 
than it is to own up to your part and let God begin to work on you. And you'll stay trapped in that lie as long as it's somebody else's problem. Until you're willing to own your part, until I'm willing to confess my sins and trust that God is faithful and just to forgive them means I got to own up to my sins and give them to him. That's why the enemy doesn't want sin to exist in this world. That's why he's fighting so hard to eradicate the idea of sin. And what's true for you is true for you. And what's true for me is true for me. Because if he can defeat this idea of sin, he can keep you defeated from ever becoming who God's created you to be. And God's got better plans than that for you. He's got a better future for you than that. But you got to press against those lies. you got to fight against those things. Got to shed the lie that you're alone. In Judges 6.16, he says, The Lord said, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. You're never alone, ever. You always have God. And to take the cliche, you and God are always majority every time. But then you don't just have God, you have us. And that's why every week when people get saved, you'll hear Pastor Randy say, look, you can't do this on your own. And that's why we're here. So come back again every week because we need each other every Sunday and Monday night to come together, to encourage us, to pray for one another, to know that I'm not alone in this fight, but I'm surrounded with 600 people here in this service today that want to fight with me towards the same thing that God has for them. That we have groups like Grief Share for when you lose somebody so that you don't have to grieve the loss of a loved one on your own, but you can come in and be with somebody else. That we have acts of grace for those of you that have been sexually abused, men or women, or, or gone through an abortion, that you can surround yourself with some other people who've experienced what you've experienced, who've walked the road you've walked and have found victory through Jesus on the other side. But you can't do that on your own. We got men's groups and women's groups that want to help you be the man or woman of God that they've called you to be. We have life groups that meet here on campus, tribe that meets here on Monday nights for college ministry. Because we want to put you with somebody who's walked the same road you've walked and has found victory through Christ on the other side. And as long as you want to walk that road alone, you're giving the enemy the win in your life because you can't do it alone. You need God and we need each other. That's the lie of the enemy that we have to fight against. My last point is this. To shed the chains of fear, you have to embrace the Father's love. I'm going to encourage you this week to go through and read Judges 6 through 8. Read the entire story of Gideon. But throughout those three chapters, as you look at the story of Gideon, you can't help but recognize the love of the Father in that story. God stepped right down into Israel's mess. They didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. He didn't say, get your act together and then I'll come in. He stepped right down in the middle of it and said, I'll be with you. And I'm going to help you through this. And I'm going to help you find a way out of the mess you're in. Screams the love of the Father. All the way to the cross when Jesus stepped down in our mess and died for us so that we could be free. The love of the Father. But listen, you're never going to break the chains of fear if you can't understand the love that Jesus has for us. The love that Jesus has for you. Listen to me. The opposite of fear is not faith. The opposite of fear is love. So many times we want to tie fear to faith. But I would suggest that we get the wrong connection there. The opposite of fear is love. Because those that love me, I'm not afraid of. And I'll put faith in those people all day long because I know they love me and want what's best for me. But I won't put faith in somebody that I don't know loves me. And I will be more hesitant to put as much faith in that person as I will the one that loves me. And that's why I would suggest to you that the opposite of faith or fear is not faith, but it's love. Because if you could understand how much God loves you, you would have no problem putting all of your faith in him because you would know that he is trustworthy. And that's not even just my opinion. I'll back that one up with scripture here for you. You can jot this down and read it later. First John chapter four, verses 16 through 18 says this, and we know how much God loves us and we put our trust in his love 
God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And we, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. Notice it's love, not faith. Our love grows grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment because we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Listen, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Not some fear. Perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Hear me, you can never be free from fear in your life until you can understand the perfect love of the Father and the love that he has for you. And when you do, you will understand that every fear you have is unfounded because of the love he has for you. That fear is based on nothing. And that is the lie of the enemy to keep you trapped. Because he knows people will go years and years and years carrying the weight of those lies and the weight of those sins while the love of the Father is right in front of them if they could just learn to embrace it and shed those things. And that's what God wants for you today. That's what I want for you. That's why I'm willing to call sin what it is. And I'm willing to speak truth into the lies because that's what the Father has for you and that's what he wants for you today. We have the perfect example of what fear is based off the news over the last week and what happened in Las Vegas. And how many people now across this country are now walking around and living in fear because of what took place last week? Afraid to go out, afraid to do anything, afraid that they could be the next one on the news that experiences something else like that. Because that's right where the enemy wants to keep people because if he can keep us trapped in fear, he has us beat that we'll never become the people who God has called us to be. We'll never be able to take bold steps of faith as long as we're tied up and lost in fear. And I've spent so much of my life wrapped up in the chains of fear. If I could be honest with you, and afraid of failure at every turn, that somehow I'm going to fail God or I'm going to fail somebody else which leads me to the fear of not being good enough and that I'm not going to measure up. That I'm going to be that pastor that stumbles and falls into sin and ends up on the news and everybody's going to point to me and use me as an excuse not to follow God. That I'm not going to be a good enough husband or father to my wife and kids and that they're somehow going to hate me or hate God as they grow up. Fear of taking steps of faith Because what if God doesn't provide this time? What if I'm not hearing him correctly? And fear becomes this thing that begins to define who we are. But I don't wanna get to the end of my life and think the measure of my life has been based upon the things I was afraid of. And I've read this quote in a book, this question, and I wanna share it with you today. Where did we get this idea that the goal of life is to arrive safely at death? Where did this idea get into the church that God's idea of life is to somehow arrive safely at death? Where did we get this idea that that God has called us to save up a retirement, spend the last 20 years of our life in ease and comfort, and somehow just slide into eternity with him? Not that those things are bad things to desire, and I believe there are wisdom in planning and making those provisions, but if the measure of my life is to see how comfortably I can enter death, then I've been living for the wrong thing. And I can't find a scripture to back that up. The early church lived every day under the threat that their life could be taken from them. They lived every day that in a moment's notice, somebody could come in, take all that they had, and if they wanted to, take everything from them. And the early church didn't grab a blanket of fear, and they didn't just wrap themselves up and and just kind of hope that everything was going to work out okay. No. And they lived in a bold and radical love that looked the enemy in the face every day 
And so you're not going to keep me wrapped up in those lies. I'm going to go out and love the way God's called me to love. I'm going to go out and live the way God's called me to live. And I'm going to be the bold man or woman of God that he's called me to be. And that's what God wants for you today. He wants your life to be like Gideon's life. He wants your life to be like Daniel's life. He wants your life to be like Esther and all of those other incredible stories throughout the Bible who accomplished great things for God. He's not looking for somebody with super ordinary strength or super ordinary faith. He's just looking for somebody that will take a radical step of obedience and follow him. And maybe you're here today and you're living in that lie of sin. You somehow are afraid even now that, that somebody's going to look at you and what are they going to think of me? And, and I'm living in this sin and, and I'm in church and I'm just going to put my fake smile on and pretend like everything's okay. And you're going to stay trapped again when you leave this place when you don't have to. I want to ask you today, here in this service, watching online, take that blanket off. Take off those chains of fear. Take off those chains of sin. Take off the chains of those lies and begin to walk in who God has called you to be. Find the freedom that he died to give you because he loves you. He's not waiting to destroy you. He's waiting to save you. He's waiting to set you free. He's standing here with open arms today. If you would just take that blanket of false security off and come to him. He's here for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, those of you that are in here, those of you that are watching online, I want to speak to you today. Maybe that's you. You're living in the lies of sin. You're wrapped up in those chains and you don't know how to get free. I'm here to tell you Jesus is that freedom for you today. And if you would just confess those sins, let go of those things, take that blanket off and give it to God, he would set you free and make you a new person. And if that's you today and you want that new life that Christ has for you, would you just slip your hand up right now so that we can pray with you? Is there anybody? Say, so that's me, Pastor. One hand right back there. Anybody else? Say, that's me, Pastor. I want to be free. I'm done living in this. I'm done walking in this. One more. Those of you that raised your hands, would you mind to look up for me for just a second? Would you mind to come up front and let me pray with you for just a moment? Nothing to embarrass you, nothing to point you out. We just want to pray with you and celebrate the new life that God has for you. Yeah. What's your name? Margaret. Margaret. Yeah. We're going to wait and we're going to pray together. God is so proud of you. He loves you. You've done the greatest thing you could ever do today when you raised your hand. That's right. What's your name? Mel Carlson. Mel, yeah. It's awesome. What a day to celebrate together, isn't it? God is good. We're going to pray together. I'm going to invite those of you guys that are out there to pray with us. There's nothing magical about this prayer, but if you mean it from the bottom of your heart, believe that God's going to save you, make your life new. Amen? All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, I need you to forgive me for my sins and to set me free. I give my life to you and I put you in charge. Help me to love you, Jesus. Help me to get baptized and to pray and to get into your word and get connected to your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, just like Pastor Randy says, we can help you, but you got to come back. You got to keep showing up and let us be the church and be here for you to help you do that. Can you do that for us? Yes. That's what we like to hear. That's awesome. If you could go right over there, those people want to pray with you for just a minute. Can we stay in Lone Star?
Here's what I believe today. I believe there are other people here that if you could be really bold in just a moment, you would say, Pastor, there are some sins in my life that, that I'm wrestling against and fighting against that I need God to set me free. Maybe there's some lies in your life that you're believing that you need God to set you free from. And if that's you, would you slip your hand up right now so we can all pray together? Yeah, thank you so much. Sort of love about Cowboy Church. We don't gotta pretend to be anything other than what we are and ask God to help us to be better, amen? Let's pray together across this place. Lift your hands up and let's pray for each other. Jesus, we love you. We are so thankful for your word and your truth that sets us free. God, I pray for those that are trapped by the lies of the enemy, those that are trapped in sin that the enemy wants to use to destroy them. I pray today would be a day that you set them free, that you help them to walk in the truth and the love that you have for them, Father, and to find the freedom in you that you have for them. That today would be a, a defining moment in their life, God, where they can begin to walk and live boldly in who you've called them to be and who you've designed them to be, Father. May we begin to write our own stories of radical love and bold faith as we follow you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you and we ask all this in your name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Our prayer team is up here. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, please come after service. Let one of them pray with you. We love you and we'll see you guys next week.